So it is 12 o'clock and for the sake of time, I think we're gonna get started right away. I am Nikisha Ridgeway. I am the Chief Operating Officer at Starbridge Services and I am a co-chair for CCAC along with Dr. Candace Lucas. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, CCAC and then I'm gonna hand it over. So CCAC is the Community Cancer Advisory Council, which is a group of individuals interested in working to lessen the burden of cancer within Wilmot's 27 county catchment area. Our mission is to bring together the community and Wilmot in order to improve cancer care from prevention through survivorship. We focus on health disparities and access to care issues, especially in marginalized, underserved communities. CCAC is happy to co-host the Conversations on Cancer series, bringing information on cancer health disparities and cutting edge cancer care to health providers and to the community. So welcome. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Lucas. So oh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad you are all joining us today. Uh, I am the other co-chair of the CCAC along with Nakisha, and I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Friedberg today. Um, during this presentation, please feel free to enter any questions that you have in the Q&A box, uh, which you can locate on the bottom of your screen, and our presenters will be happy to, to answer those questions throughout the talk. So just uh, introducing Dr. Friedberg, uh, we'd like to welcome him. Dr. Friedberg is the director of the James P. Wilmot Cancer Center and the director of hematological malignancies clinical research at U of R. He is board certified in hematology and oncology and his work is focused on the development of novel therapies for patients with lymphoma. He has received he has received a Scholar in Clinical Research Award from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society for his work with an oral inhibitor of a protein called Psych. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He is a founding member of the Lymphoma Epidemiology of Outcomes Consortium and chair of the Lymphoma Committee in the SW, SWOG group of, of the NCI Clinical Trials Network. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Friedberg. Thank you, Candice and Nikisha. And it's really a true honor for me to um, introduce Dr. Allison, uh, who is uh, the chair of the Department of Immunology and the Weiss Distinguished University Chair for Cancer Research uh, and executive director of the immunotherapy platform at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And he's really most known for his work on immunotherapy, uh, discovering a new cancer therapy by inhibition of negative immune regulation. Uh, this work has really paved the way for the field of immune checkpoint blockade, which is a drug that has been tremendously active in a wide variety of cancers. Uh, and he's currently continuing this work to improve immune checkpoint blockade therapies currently used and to identify new targets uh, for immunotherapy interventions. For this work, uh, he's been awarded the Lasker Prize, but most prominently in 2018, he earned the Nobel Prize in medicine. And uh, it, as I said, welcome to Rochester. It's sunny uh, with a lot of snow on the ground here. and. Uh, we're really privileged that you were able to join us. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really honored and especially pleased to be here to, in, the, in the role of being able to introduce your, your speaker, Sharon Belvin, who's really uh, meant a lot to me over the last uh, more than a decade now, almost 15 years, I think, uh, that uh, I've known her. Um, and I'd like to just introduce her by way of, of telling you how I met her, met her and how our friendship developed and give you some idea of the, the kind of person she is. Um, I, I lost many family members to cancer when I was young. My mother and two of her brothers actually all, all three died of, of cancer. So and I've lost, I lost a brother to uh, uh, prostate cancer. So I'm well aware of the toll that cancer takes on people and on their families. And that 
sort of was always in my mind. I'm an immunologist. I mainly was studying how immunotherapy worked, uh, but uh, I was just mentioned I found this negative circuit that had not been found before and, and had the idea that it could be blocked in order to unleash an immune system to attack cancer. And after many years of trying to convince people to do it, we finally got it in trials. And I'll skip through all that. I, I did the work when I was at the University of California at Berkeley, but then I moved to Sloan Kettering because I wanted to be where the trials were just so I could take uh, part in them, you know, and kind of offer advice, you know, from a scientist view when, when I could. Any event, the, the phase one trials were over. There was an expanded phase two trial. And um, one day, my uh, clinical colleague, the melanoma uh, clinical colleague, Jed Walchuk, called me from the outpatient clinic. I was in my lab in my office and said, Jim, you got to come down to the outpatient clinic. I said, You know, what's going on, Jed? I'm busy. He said, No, you got to come down here. You just got to, you, you got to see this. And so, I said, okay, it must be, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't that big a deal, but it was about five blocks, you know, I had to go out and walk and, you know, go find it in New York, you know. And uh, anyway, I got there, went into this room and it was uh, uh, Jen and Dr. Walchuk and then Sharon and her, and her husband and her parents. And I walked into the room and all of a sudden, you know, everybody gets really excited and starts hugging and and kissing and crying. I mean, I, there was so much cries of, of, of joy, actually. Um, to put this in context, at the time, uh, you know, I got to see the data coming in from the trial, uh, but it was numbers, you know, it was, oh, well, there were, you know, six complete responders or seven partial responders, but, you know, 10 people progressed, etc. And I, you know, I just saw this tabular, but I'm not, you know, I had, I'm not a physician, so I had absolutely zero contact with the patients. And um, what had just happened that morning, um, I found out a little bit later, uh, is that, that Sharon, and I won't go through the details, except she just had a massive, massive trouble, you know, ex experience, a terrible experience with melanoma. At the time, that disease, the median survival after diagnosis was seven months. And for someone who was just 22 years old, you know, just beginning her life, you know, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's, um, you know, a really, really terrible sort of situation to be in. But uh, through all the, and I won't go into details again, but through all that Sharon went through, including, you know, radiation, two other immunotherapies, which are being tested at the time and, and radiation, you know, she just still kept progressing and had the courage when Jed offered the chance to get it up a trial, one of the early trials of, of ipilimumab was the name of the drug, blocks a molecule called CTLA-4 um, in melanoma. You know, she, she got in it and uh, what had happened that morning, it turns out that she'd been told that she was doing well, no evidence of disease. She came back and the, the, there was no evidence of cancer anywhere in her body after having been diagnosed with, I believe, 31 lung metastases and brain metastases and a few cutaneous metastases. And Jed told me when they first saw that, the pathologist called him up and said, I think you got the wrong, what's going on here? I think you sent me the wrong, the wrong x-rays because there's no cancer. And there was, you know, there was massive before. And so, you know, at that point she was cured. And, uh, but that what, what was beating was all about. It was, as I said, it was really, really emotional to put a face to, you know, what I've been trying to do. And, and a, and a young face, and again, somebody just just starting out. She picked me up and and uh, almost crushed a rib, I think, uh, <laughs> and uh, the embrace. Um, anyway, that 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 was our first message meeting, which gave me a lot to think about. But a few months later, or not months, but a few years later, she sent me a photo of her first child, and uh, we've been staying in touch a little bit. But I was also staying in touch, you know, about her condition with uh, Dr. Walchuk and, you know, we were talking about her, you know, a young woman just started a career. And one of the things that they were telling, you know, women that, you know, you, you probably shouldn't have children after this. And, um, you know, for most, most cancer therapies, that's not an issue because the chemotherapies, it results in sterility anyway, but I really couldn't understand. I could understand why you shouldn't get this drug while you were afraid, but I really couldn't really understand any good reason for that. And I just wondered. Anyway, 
Sharon, you know, decided, well, I've, you know, I made it this far. I'm not going to let this hold me back. I'm going to, I'm going to have kids anyway. And so sure enough, I got a picture of her first child and then a couple of years later of her second child. Anyway, we, we stayed in touch. I met her at some meetings and uh, just got to know just how she never let this slow her down. You know, she didn't let the doctors tell her your life's over or you've got to compromise and you, those are things you can't do. You know, she just kept going and living her life and wonderfully cheerful person. I've just treasured knowing her ever since. And I learned so much about personal courage and 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 maybe think more about you know the patients and 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 what's going on with them and what they do. Any anyway, the the um, we as I said, we've been friends now for I think that was in two thousand and six when we first met. Um, and so it's been, you know, almost 15 years now. And uh, we're such friends that I, she went with me to Stockholm for the Nobel Prize and went through all the ceremonies. And uh, uh, was, I was so happy to be able to share share that that with her. But uh, Sharon, I learned so much from you and it's been a treasure knowing you all these years. And I look forward to many, many more. And uh, we're gonna remain friends forever. So, oh, my gosh. Sharon Bell. <laughs> oh my gosh, how in the world I got to compose myself now and not be emotional and you have no idea the amount of thanks and gratitude that I have for you. So I know I say it all the time, but thank you. Thank you for everything. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to collect myself and then start talking. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter how many times we present together. Uh, which, thank God, has been quite a few over the years. Thanking him, Joe, though, never gets old for me, ever. It always feels like that very first meeting when I was just told that I was in remission. It always feels like that. I'm in awe because without him, I would not be here. You see, you have to know that Dr. Allison didn't follow the rules when he was study studying the T-cells. And I refuse to follow the rules that cancer set forth. When you combine these two things together, you get the health equivalent of a nuclear bomb. <laughs> Nobel winning science that changes the world and a cancer patient promising to pay it forward until the day she dies. So here we are, as Allison said, 16 years later, and I have the privilege of being still able to invoke patient awareness. And Dr. Allison is still in the lab ensuring that these patients have an immunotherapy that will work no matter their diagnosis. As Allison is famous for saying, I, I can't do his voice, so I'm not. <laughs> we still have more work to do. Neither one of us will rest until all of the patients are able to be paired with an immunotherapy that can offer them a cure, not just simply a few more months of life. Until all patients are given the same incredible gift that I was an entire life. Back in 2004, I was planning an entirely different life than the one I'm currently living. <laughs> Never in my world did I think that today would be today. While Allison was trying to get his game-changing cancer treatment into the hands of a drug company, which was a challenging thing to do, that's an understatement of the century, it was a challenging thing to do, I was in grad school. Since I was a little girl, I had dreams of becoming an elementary school teacher. I do believe that if you can positively impact the life of a child, that you have the possibility to change the world. So there I was in the fall of my last year. I was finishing up my student teaching and working on my thesis, but something just didn't feel right. You know how when you exercise, it's supposed to get easier, not harder. You know, you run, you run, you practice, and then it's supposed to get easier, right? Your lungs are not going to feel like they're sitting on, over there on the pavement. <laughs> well, that didn't happen for me. For me, it kept getting harder. My times kept getting slower, and the amount of distance that I was running kept getting less. I couldn't breathe correctly. Being a poor college student, I went to student health, which was free at the university, and they diagnosed me with bronchitis, they brushed it off and they gave me an inhaler, I think, and then they set me on my way. I truly didn't think anything else at the time. The thing was, is that my symptoms never improved. 
Over the course, course of the fall and winter, I wasn't just experiencing shortness of breath during exercise. I was out of breath just talking. So even just having this conversation with you, I would have to take a breath in between the words. And that's not normal. I don't care who you are, that's not normal, especially in a young 22 year old. So back I went <laughs> to student health. And again, they said that I must have some kind of bronchitis. And they gave me an inhaler and sent me on my way. No, no chest x-ray at all. They figured out that because I was exposed to all of those kids every single day during my student teaching, that it must be something that they gave to me. That's the reason I kept getting sick. They didn't think that a healthy, active 22 year old sitting right in front of them could have shortness of breath for any other reason. Needless to say, that symptom didn't go away. In fact, now not only short of breath while I was uh, exercising and talking, but I was also extremely fatigued. But in my mind, I'm justifying all of this because never in my wildest dreams did I think that I had cancer. I was like, come on, Sharon, you're in grad school. Everyone's tired in college. Come on, you're normal. You're fine. Just get up and do your work. Uh, I wish that was true. <laughs> but now we're into the late spring of 2004 when I was getting ready to graduate. Guys, this was when I became truly scared. I remember looking into the mirror in my apartment bedroom and noticing that underneath my collarbone was a lump, uh, probably about the size of, a little under the size of a golf ball maybe. Uh, because of the location, I thought breast cancer immediately, your heart starts pounding, you start sweating. Quickly contained myself and said, no, 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 you're fine. There's no cancer. Come on, Sharon, you're 22, you're, you're fine. Come on, for heaven's sakes. I remember actively having to talk myself back. Just a bump and nothing else. But that nagging feeling never went away. So before graduation, I went home to visit my parents and I told them what was going on. I tried to make light of the situation because I didn't want to freak them out. I was already freaked out myself. But my mom, being a mom, <laughs> said, ah, uh, no, you're gonna come and go to the doctor. Uh, she happened to work for a physician at that time, so we were quite lucky to have a good relationship with them. So at that primary care office, that doctor said to me, he didn't think it was cancer, but he couldn't sleep at night if he didn't get a surgical biopsy of it. That doctor was one in, was the first in a line of physicians that truly saved my life. Because when the results of that surgical biopsy came back as melanoma, my world spun. Ah. <laughs> to be honest, I, uh, I don't have a lot of memories about that time. I remember just being so incredibly scared. You hear stage four melanoma and you think a death sentence. You, I would have had money, all of my money, that I would not be here all of these years later and talking to you all about cancer survivorship and immunotherapy. Oh, sorry. I went on to autopilot. I was sent to get a CT just to see what, what kind of cancer they were dealing with, where it was. And I found out that at the age of 22, that I had tumors throughout my lungs, my chest cavity, and probably my liver. I had stage four melanoma and my world stopped. When those results came back, unbeknownst to me, the doctor that my mom worked for told his staff to rebook all of his patients. So he had already come in that morning, found this out, this news, and told his front office to rebook everybody for the day. He spent all of his time that day trying to get me in to the best hospital with the best physicians that knew how to take care of melanoma. So at the end of the day, I got a phone call from him stating that I had an appointment with Dr. Jed Walchuk the very next day. Guys, imagine if those two things didn't happen. Doctors don't just completely shut off their patients for the day. And you most certainly don't get an appointment at Sloan Kettering the very next day. <laughs> that doesn't happen either. Um, I was incredibly lucky. I don't even want to think what would have happened to me if I didn't have access to that care. What I didn't tell you up until now is that I was set to be married to now my ex-husband uh, that following Saturday. 
Yay. So I was treated with chemotherapy on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and got married that Saturday. I had a port cath installed, which basically means that uh, I had something implanted underneath my skin where medications could be infused through. That way they wouldn't have to keep poking me in the arm every single time that I needed something. But when it's accessed, it has tubing hanging out of it. And I'm, I wasn't a fan of that because it was quite a lot of tubing. And I couldn't wear my strapless gown. It looked awful. And it would remind me very much about what was going on. So we opted to scale back the whole thing. I simply wore a white suit. And we made the best of a very terrible situation. We only had immediate family there. And we never went on a honeymoon. <sighs> I continued chemotherapies through the summer and the fall of 2004. I had so many side effects from this, not only extreme nausea, headache, fatigue, but also developed peripheral neuropathy, which numbness and tingling and pain isn't fun in your hands and feet. Today, I still can't feel my feet on the floor right now very well, <laughs> which makes going outside in the snow that we have out there convenient. One part. <laughs> The side effects got so bad that I couldn't uh, continue my normal treatment schedule. Despite getting those shots that could increase your red and white blood cells, I was just feeling awful. This should have been a clue to me about how this was actually working because my next CT showed that the tumors were rapidly growing. They weren't shrinking, they were growing. In fact, the winter of 2004 is when I learned that I had a brain tumor. The emotions were numbness, anger, and disbelief. How in the world could this be happening to me? So I was giving, given two options for this. Sounds great. Both options did not sound awesome, by the way. I could have traditional brain surgery, or I could participate in a clinical trial for stereotactic radio surgery. Basically, it's a knife made out of radiation. Um, this is a no-brainer. I had to meet with the, the no pun intended, by the way. <laughs> um, I had to meet with a brain surgeon just, you know, to get all my die, I's dotted and T's crossed just in case. But I was quite positive after hearing how they were going to have to cut me open and, you know, the, the recovery with that, that I was not going to opt for that right off the gate. So I signed up for this clinical trial for this new type of uh, radio surgery. I was lucky. Lucky, after one treatment, there showed no more tumor, only scar tissue. I remember laying on that table after they bolted my head. So they had to bolt your head down and then the unscrew you can come up. And uh, whether this is appropriate or not, I remember thinking, F you, cancer, <laughs> when I stood up from that table. Um, it was the first good news that I had ever gotten regarding cancer. It was the first glimmer of hope that I had received. And you don't understand the amount of anger that I had towards cancer at this time. It took away everything. So when that first came back as a positive, it was like a little bit of that weight lifted up off my shoulders. So <laughs> the relief was short-lived. I still had all of the other tumors to deal with and the chemo didn't work. Walchuk then sent me to Columbia Presbyterian, which is a great hospital too. Um, for a treatment called interleukin-2. Basically, they give you very large doses of a protein that is normally found in very small doses in the body. Believe it or not, this is actually another type of immunotherapy, although I didn't work, this one didn't work for me at all. <laughs> uh, this was the first time in my cancer journey that I actually felt like I was dying. Before this point, I knew that I had cancer, I had the breathing problems, and I knew that I had the side effects from the chemotherapy, but during interleukin-2, I felt like a cancer patient. Um, a person who I've had the pleasure of meeting with a couple of times over the last year is Dr. Anthony Ribas. Uh, I believe that he says this best, so I'm gonna quote him in this. He said, uh, it is the equivalent of giving a patient septic shock every eight hours for five days. That's exactly that. I became delirious. I remember having such a high fever on in the inpatient ward that I didn't know where I was. 
And I just knew that I was so hot. And I crawled with a gown on. Could you like, I'm picturing this after the fact, but I remember living it. I crawled with my gown on. I don't know how, because I was hooked up to like everything onto the floor of the hospital because I, I thought the floor would be colder and I would feel better if I would lay on the floor. But needless to say, they didn't want me laying on the floor. So they had this big like uh, security guy come over and lift me up off the floor because I flat out refused to get up. I was delirious. It got better though. When I left, all of my skin peeled off of my body. After two rounds of this hell on earth, I learned that not only did the cancer get bigger, but it had spread again. I was losing hope by this point. I had tried everything that I was told to try and it just wasn't working. But guess what? <laughs> things can always get worse, so things got a little bit worse. Uh, fluids start to fill up my pleural space. So think of the area between your chest and the outside of your body. There's a space there, and that's called your pleural space. And normally that, that allows your lungs to expand and contract and serves a bunch of functions. Well, mine started to fill up with fluid, a lot of fluid, like eight liters of fluid. <laughs> So much fluid that I couldn't breathe while speaking any longer. And I think my O2 sat was something like 88. It was, I did not feel well. When the non-surgical pleurodesis failed, they opted for the surgical route. Now I know that I absolutely needed this procedure. I knew that, but as a non-medical person, it sounded barbaric. <laughs> they were going to use a chemical to abrade or scar my lungs so that they could adhere my chest wall to my lung so that that space can no longer fill up with fluid, right? That sounds great. That's what we're supposed to do. Well, <laughs> in my entire life, including childbirth and all other surgeries that I've had, which have been a few, the pain that I experienced after that surgery was the worst thing in the world. My lungs felt like they were ripping apart every single time that I took a breath. And it just kept going for days. I can't remember how long that lasted, but um, the summer of 2005 wasn't a fun one for sure. To make a long story a bit shorter, because this can go on for a while, we tried a bunch of other chemotherapies, but nothing worked. I had zero quality of time, quality of life, and not a lot of hope left. I feel like my hope was stolen from me a bit because I kept trying and trying and trying and trying, and every single time that I tried something other than the brain, brain radiation, um, that it not only didn't work, but it got worse. <laughs> so I think either divine intervention, call it luck, call it whatever, but I was still alive a year after my diagnosis, which as Allison said, was it, it was a feat in and of itself at the time. Here I was without any hope at all, and Dr. Allison was full of hope. What I learned at my appointment with Dr. Walchuk that day was that there was a clinical trial starting soon. It was very new and not a lot of cancer treatments worked in the way this one did. In fact, none did. <laughs> if I participated in this phase two trial, I'd be one of the first patients in the world to do so. And they did not know if it was going to work. You all need to understand that what I was feeling at this moment in my life, I was dying and I knew it. I felt it inside and out. I worked hard my entire life towards a promising future. You know, the, the good job, the house, the kids, the picket fence, the whole thing that makes you work so hard in college and is your dreams at night kind of thing. And cancer was trying to steal this from me. And so far it was winning. I didn't just want a few more months of life. I wanted a cure. So I signed on the dotted line that day. It was the fall of 2005. And I started the clinical trial that would save my life. I lived in New Jersey at the time. So every three to four weeks, I would have someone drive me into New York City. Excuse me. It was about an hour and a half from my house. 
I would receive an infusion and two shots in my leg, and then I had to travel on home. No overnight stays or anything like that. Now, I didn't know if it was the immunotherapy or just the fact that I wasn't on chemotherapy any longer, um, but this was the first time that I started to feel better. Up until this point, I had no energy to do anything. No going out with friends, no walking my dogs, nothing. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, I think that I can go walk my dogs now. That may not seem like much, but it's a gigantic thing to me. And I remember it clearly as a changing point in my perception about how my body was doing. I received tor blah, blah, blah. <laughs> four total treatments. And actually I was spared a lot of the side effects from this immunotherapy. The only two that I got was um, damaging my thyroid, which I will be forever on replacement hormone therapy. Oh, well, I'll take that. <laughs> um, and I had a really bad immune response called Rigers, um, which I had never heard of, but we're all actually hearing a little bit more of it now because of COVID. Um, but this immune response makes you feel like dying. <laughs> it makes you feel like you are dying. Um, even though it landed me back in the hospital and I was miserable, I remember looking up at my physicians and they were thrilled. <laughs> they were absolutely thrilled. I was not, but they were. Well, I learned why at my follow-up scans. It was early in 2006 when I walked into Dr. Walchuk's office and uh, that man became Dr. Good News. So he was Dr. Walchuk up until that point, but to this day, I still jokingly poke at him and call him Dr. Good News. A man who was always calm, not emotional, gave you a sense of security every time you walked into his office. Uh, he's a small, I'm 5'10", he's shorter than me. Um, I have a bigger build, he has a smaller build, so just picture that. And this man who, who was always calm and put together opens up the door and was, That's, that, that wasn't him <laughs> at, at all. He was beaming from ear to ear. He goes, Sharon? The radiologist called me to make sure that he had the correct patient to compare. Just like Dr. Allison told you, the tumors that day had shrunk by over 60%. That didn't happen. That didn't happen ever to anyone. That's how Dr. Allison, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Walchuk earned his nickname, Dr. Good News. If you ever have an appointment with him, that's what you need to call him. <laughs> but for me, I, I think I was really waiting for the other shoe to drop. I had grown so used to hearing such bad news that it was almost like a protection mechanism for me that I wouldn't let the good news in because I was protecting myself for when it became not there anymore. But the good news kept coming and kind of wore that protection barrier down. Every single scan that I got after that one came back with no evidence of disease. <laughs> so basically only scar tissue was left. My lungs will always be scarred. They're awful actually, but they couldn't find any cancer anywhere. I believe it was the end of August or the beginning of September in 2006 when the news that I never thought would be given to me was. Dr. Walchuk officially told me that I was in remission. He immediately though, he goes, you're in remission. Um, and then just like it was part of normal conversation to say afterwards, would you like to meet the man who created the drug? And then he just smiled and waited. Of course, I said, yes, dumbstruck. And that was the story that you heard from Dr. Allison. <laughs> I had no idea that uh, Jed had not prepped him about what was going to happen. He certainly didn't prep me at all. Um, but yeah, Dr. Allison described it accurately. I remember him walking in tears and I just ran at him. Now, granted at the time it was 350 pounds too. So I ran at you as a 5'10 obese woman. And I think I picked him up, gave him a bear hug and lifted him up off the ground. He must've, uh, I'm surprised he still talks to me. <laughs> um, but you know what that day? was the beginning of all the good days that were possible now because of immunotherapy. Without immunotherapy, those days, the days that I'm living ever since then would not have been possible. 
And guess what? Cancers never come back. Knock on wood. <laughs> my entire adult life was taken up by fighting cancer. I had to create my new normal. I didn't know what the heck that was. I was always a cancer patient. How was I going to do that? Now it was 2007 and I felt tired. I was morbidly obese. Like I said, I was 350 plus pounds by the time I had the courage to get on the scale. I still had neuropathy from chemotherapy. Um, it's got, gotten better over the years, but I still have it now. But I knew that no matter what, I wanted to be a mom. I remember asking Dr. Walchuk on my very first day, first time meeting him, he was describing all of the chemotherapy treatments and what we had to do. And I remember not hearing a whole lot of that and just thinking, wow, I'm never going to get to be a parent. And what he said to me was, let's worry about this first. <laughs> let's fight the cancer. And then we can see afterwards if you can be a parent. I now know that the chemotherapies that I was on should have not allowed me to have children. Flat out should not have allowed. But <laughs> two months later, I was pregnant with my now 13-year-old daughter, Lily Beth. And when I called his office to tell him, that place freaked out. The stories they tell now when I meet with them about what it was like that day to hear that, they were scared out of their minds because I'm embarrassed to say that I did not research this first um, about the things that could happen to my children after all of these treatments or after myself having cancer. I would do that today, but I was naive at the time and I chose not to. But that naivety let me have two healthy, beautiful children because not only did I have my daughter Lily in 2008, but I now have my son, James, who's 11. And no, even though Allison will tell you that James is named after him. <laughs> it's a good name though. Um, I have two beautiful, healthy children. But even though I survived cancer, I didn't feel like I survived cancer. I still felt sick, tired, and my whole body hurt. I mean, parenting's hard enough in the beginning, but do it in an obese body and one that's been wrecked by cancer and your world kind of stops. You feel awful. I knew that if I ever wanted health, quote unquote health again, that I would actually have to take control of that. I started to eat well and exercise. I learned all that I could about nutrition, anything and everything. So if, you know, grandma's, aunt's, friends, so-and-so said something, I would read about it. <laughs> Over the course of a year, I lost about 150 pounds without medical intervention, but I could not for the life of me keep it off. So back to the education, I went. <laughs> I studied to become a personal trainer and later a board certified health coach. I never went back to being a teacher. I knew that I had a different calling in life. Instead, I entered the medical world, helping doctors and patients manage and cure lifestyle induced illnesses, helping my clients reach whatever goals they may have. My clients are given a new lease on life, just like I was. I balanced my time between work kids and speaking about immunotherapy <laughs> because you know what? I made a promise to God while I was in an MRI machine once early on in this when nothing was going well. If I was able to survive cancer, I would forever pay it forward. At the time of my diagnosis, I remember asking if anyone, any had lived, I was looking for anything to hold on to while I was living this daily hell, but there wasn't, there was, there was no one. <sighs> I promised that if I lived through cancer, that I would be that for every cancer patient that contacted me for the rest of my life. And I've kept that promise for the last 16 years. I've had the honor of speaking with both Walchuk and Allison all over these times we're at conferences together. And like Allison said, he invited me to Sweden for the Nobel ceremony, which was one of the highlights of my life. Um, and I'm lucky to call both he and his wife, Pam, friends. But um, no offense to either of them, but the best part of this is still speaking with patients. 
I get messages through Facebook, email, word of mouth, anything and everything, every time Dr. Allison uh, speaks. <laughs> so I have patients reach out. But you know what, though? That makes the battle that I went through worth it to talk with people and to give a little bit of hope in a hopeless situation um, is priceless. There was a woman that contacted me, her husband did many, many, many months ago, and she had stage four melanoma and she was pregnant. Uh, last night, actually, she contacted me, the baby's healthy and uh, her scans are clear. Ah. That's why I speak about this. That's why Dr. Allison is still in the lab, so that every single patient can have an experience like that. <sighs> so now jump ahead. <laughs> I was asked to give this presentation today and because it's a little bit longer of a time frame than I'm used to, so like I can, I can get, talk about cancer for like 10 or 15 minutes with my eyes closed, but this one's a bit longer. And so it really made me reflect on the details, which I hadn't done. <laughs> a whole lot of because it's difficult. But, you know, what would have happened if I didn't have insurance while I had cancer? I took for granted at the time that I had insurance that can go anywhere to be treated and that the best hospital in the world for this took my insurance. What if I, what if that wasn't the case? What if I didn't have a car to drive the hour and a half to New York City or even someone to, to drive me or the gas to get there. Unfortunately, many cancer patients today felt, face these health disparities. Every single moment of their cancer journey is not only filled up with the emotional aspect of cancer, but also the physical, how the heck am I going to get there? I know the treatment is here, but I'm here and there's no way to get me to where my treatment is. I know that if any one of those factors, any of them was not in place, that I wouldn't be here today, that my kids would not be here today. And a life without them isn't even worth thinking about. <sighs> with outreach programs like those being developed in Rochester, patients, no matter their station in life, or physical location for that matter, will be given hope with the diagnosis of cancer. Programs like the Promote Health, uh, Prevent Cancer. This is, this is one of my favorites. I wish they would have had this when I went through cancer. <laughs> um, this is a free, free eight week program that meets weekly and they focus on both nutrition and exercise. It's free and those people will be taught the same thing that I was struggling with all through this. I, I couldn't, when they were telling me about that, I couldn't believe it. Every patient is, a, is assigned a social worker. Um, I'm sure that things have changed even at Sloan over the years since I left, but he, at Rochester, they're given a social worker and that person, that one person is who they deal with that will help arrange rides to treatments, will help give you a gas card if needed. Um, they can point you towards something called the Hope Lodge, which is again, amazing. This is a place for patients who live outside the treatment area to live for free. <laughs> so I was just in awe at all that they are doing to help their patient population. It seemed almost too good to be true. And then they go on to tell me about this place called the Integrative Oncology Center. I want to go there and I'm no longer a cancer patient. <laughs> But actually, it seems to be a mecca for cancer patients and survivors. They have things like acupuncture and yoga. Chefs come in and teach them about healthy cooking for free. <laughs> These are the things that, while some people may not view as gigantic, to the cancer patient, they're game changers. That person is experiencing hell on earth. And all of these things add up to a little bit of a side of relief for the patient. I know for a fact that I would have loved to have any of this in place. It would have helped me. Now, let's not forget one of the leading causes of cancer, which is smoking, and we all know that. Smoking cessation treatments here are offered free to anyone. 
including the nicotine replacement, free. But they were giving me this list of all of these uh, programs and I just sat there like, all for free. <laughs> Another exciting smoking cessation program is actually a research pro pro project, but it's just for Latinos. It's very similar to the approach, but, uh, but since it's research, the participants are paid <laughs> for their participation. With the goal of ever improving, they are now offering something called Talk Tuesday, which I actually would like to be a part of because this sounds absolutely amazing. This is where the community doctors and researchers get together to address what the perceptions of the community are about cancer and its treatment. Through programs like the ones I listed, this will ensure that Rochester Medical Center will remain cutting edge in addressing the needs of the community that they serve. In doing so, they are given the patients a gift, a gift that is deserved by all. <laughs> you know, as I was going about and writing this and making notes, I had my Alexa uh, and playing in the background, which hopefully it doesn't turn on now, um, for my playing my news brief. And so while I'm thinking about cancer, it's talking about um, the election and COVID and I am not going to talk about the election today. I'm not touching that with a 10 foot pole, but COVID, yeah, well, that's a different story. <laughs> the world seems to be facing a cancer diagnosis of sorts right now. People are scared and angry. Some people are indifferent and believe it's not there. Despite all though, little bright lights of hope are popping up from all over the world. Social media has connected us like nothing else could. We are all facing COVID together. This I'm not alone feeling is propelling the world forward. It is also what every single patient is searching for. You know, I actually find myself saying the same thing to everyone that I've said to cancer patients over the years. In facing and moving through life, Life-altering events will take strength and courage no matter what. In this process, parts of us may be forever changed. However, we are afforded the choice to add back in anything that we wish. We have the opportunity to create a better and more resilient us. With COVID came the opportunity for us to build a better healthcare system. Things were noticed that never were noticed before. These advances that might have taken five or more years are now part of everyday care. For example, telemedicine never really took part in that at all, and now it's everywhere. That's a game changer for people who live in rural areas. Not having to come into the office, that's unbelievable. Um, apps that were unheard just a year unheard of just a year ago are now normal. Um, well, you, can, you can use your phone to take an EKG. I didn't know that, but it's true. Imagine for a person who lives two hours away from their doctor's office, able to give themselves an EKG at home so they didn't have to go into the doctor's office for that. And now they also don't have to go back into the doctor's office for the results of that EKG. That just automatically, just because of the ease of access to care, increases the adherence to the treatment plans given by the physicians. And adherence to treatment plans leads to healthier patients. And healthier patients leads to a lower rate of cancer. Obesity is directly linked to over 13 types of cancer. It could be more now, but that's what I remember them saying. One of, one of the top ones being breast cancer in postmenopausal women. But not only cancer, but obesity is a contributor to people dying of cardiovascular disease and diabetes, as well as chronic illnesses, such as liver and kidney disease, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, and things like depression. I didn't regain my quality of life until my diet and exercise changed. And I know that if you're living with any of those chronic diseases that your life can feel like a slow death, but it's a death that can be prevented. I want to leave you with this thought. Life altering events don't have to be a bad thing. How we view them is our choice. 
I would never change the fact that I got cancer despite all of the horrific events that I had to go through. It made me who I am today. And I'm proud of who I am today. I'm truly grateful for the lessons that I learned during cancer. But truth be told, I don't ever want to learn those lessons again. <laughs> so I hope I get to be speaking with you all in another 15 or 20 years saying that all is still good. I appreciate your time today. And if you have any questions, I will answer them now. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. It's, uh, this one's from Claudia and she says, how lucky you are to find a doctor willing to take a chance at trying creative things. How would you encourage someone to ask their doctor to try something, especially when society is so risk averse? Well, for me, my, I went to one of the best facilities that there are for this, one where clinical trials are offered. So my doctor was always on board with trying anything. Um, I, my suggestion would be if you have a doctor who is unwilling to try something, find a new doctor. <laughs> um, maybe you're just not a good fit for each other. If, he's, if he or she is telling you that, you know, you shouldn't try this for a specific reason, that's different. But if your doctor truly does not want to try anything else just because it's outside of their comfort zone, I'd find a new doctor. <laughs> um, let's see. Has immunotherapy been tried for rare cancer called something I can't pronounce? <laughs> you know what though? I, I don't know. There's been so many trials of this over the years. Um, it's been tried in quite a few cancers. Um, prostate most recently, I believe. Um, now with that, the success rates are a little bit lower. Thus, Allison is still in the lab today. Um, but maybe one of the, the physicians on the panel um, could answer that question for you. Let's see. Um, it seems that there are more cancer diagnoses recently than in the past. In my family and friend circle, about 30%, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, are dealing with a cancer diagnosis. I will agree with that. Um, I don't know about the 30% part, but it does seem to be a lot more. Now, I, I know that that's twofold. I mean, we're better at testing than we ever were in the past, um, but something's going on because quite a lot of people that I know are not here anymore because of cancer. And we have better drugs now to treat cancer um, than we ever did before. So I am so sorry that you're experiencing that in your family. And I wish I had an answer as to why this is happening. Um, what was the name of the immunotherapy that you received? I'm not going to say the whole name because I can't, but it's called IPI for short. Uh, let's see. Can you reflect a little bit more on your work with cancer patients? How do you integrate your life experiences with the knowledge of nutrition and exercise when working alongside patients? Um, so I actually used to run a cancer program locally here. Um, we would take people from date of diagnosis uh, through survivorship and we led them through exercises and taught nutrition. So we spoke with their physicians and given the medications that they were on um, their physicians wanted them to adhere to a specific diet. And so we did so, you know, at these uh, programmed events. I do tend to take a harder edged approach to things, I think, uh, because I uh, have been through this in the past. And I think that because I've done it, people maybe take it more seriously coming from me, maybe not just from a physician, but if I tell you to do it and I know exactly how it feels to do what you're doing, then People usually adhere to that. <laughs> Anything else? Great, Sharon. What can I say? Thank you. Very well. Gracias, muito obrigada, and thank you in all the language that you can imagine is not enough. Um, what a great way to launch our community conversations. Uh, we're looking forward to have many more in the coming month. And this effort um, is geared internally to all of us at Wilmot, at the University of Rochester, as well as our community partners and patients. You set the stage, you and Dr. Allison. You know, um, Dr. Allison remind me and remind all of us why 
Dr. Friedberg and Wilmar Cancer Institute is working to get an NCI designation. A lot of work, but he inspired us with the possibility of the cure of cancer. Uh, thank you for bringing him along and, and for him to share his uh, journey towards curing patients that now has had this impact. Um, by having the NCI designation here uh, in Rochester, we're gonna bring more resources in the clinical trials that made the difference in your life. Uh, we look forward um, to this designation and we count with all of you in the call um, for that. And not only you, but as you spread the word, we're working hard to bring the designation here for you. Uh, it's not for us, it's for our community. I, so, hope, I hope you realize what a great gift that is for the patients that you serve. I can, I, yes, and by hearing it from you. It really is, it really, really is. Um, Sharon, every time that I hear your story, you touch me um, and I, I get emotional with you. Um, you make me think about the work that we do here uh, to prevent cancer and the importance of keeping an eye on everything that we do should serve all, as you brilliant said. You know, it's not fair. That's giving to so uh, few of us. We count on you. You said that you're gonna be back in 15 years. I don't think so. I count on you. I think we need to have you back here uh, to continue to inspire us faculty, researchers, community and patients. Your story and your commitment to make the difference, uh, it's there. And we'd love to have you again uh, talking about your wellness and how uh, cancer has been this, you have been able to turn cancer, cancer in a beautiful thing towards the life that you have today. Uh, thank Absolutely. you, Sharon, so much. And we are not going to wait 15 years to have <laughs> you back. Looking forward. And with that, I don't know uh, if Dr. Friedberg want to say a couple words to close our first community conversation. I'll make sure that both you and Dr. Allens receive um, a recognition from our team for you spending uh, your kindness, your knowledge and your lives with us. My Dr. Pleasure. Incredibly inspiring. And, and there's really, um, it's, it's a challenge to, to follow that, that um, moving talk. I can assure you and for people here in Rochester that we at Wilmot are committed to um, being the type of center that was described. Uh, we enrolled a record number of patients on clinical trials last year and are continuing to push the field forward. And it's with the courage of people like Sharon that this field has moved forward and the treatment that she described is now standard for patients with many cancers. So um, with that, I'll, I'll leave you and, and thank Paula for arranging this and look forward to future conversations. Although the bar is very high, <laughs> um, I, I have a hard time believing we're gonna be able to match this for quite a while. Yes, thank you, Sharon. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Looking forward, the next can co cancer community conversation is gonna be about COVID and cancer and looking forward to uh, talking with you again in the next couple months. Thank you, everyone. You have a great day. Thank you, Sharon. All my love to you. Thank you.